Hey guys, I'm Elizabeth McCravey, a website designer and business coach for entrepreneurs and your host for the Breakthrough Brand Podcast, the show that's all about pulling back the curtain on how to actually build a successful business. I don't skim the surface around here. If you want a deep dive into the nitty gritty details of what it takes to run a successful business and stand out in a crowd, you're in the right place. After creating a multiple six figure a year website design business in my 20s, I'm ready to share everything I've learned and everything I'm still learning because I believe the keys to building a thriving business should never be a secret. Here you'll find episodes that are actionable, direct, and fun, like friends chatting business over coffee and a fresh, honest take on the reality of being an entrepreneur. If you're ready to master online marketing, branding, website design, mindset, and business strategy, then this is the podcast for you. It's time to build your breakthrough brand. Let's do this. All right, so today we're talking about one of my favorite topics and one that I honestly don't cover on this podcast enough considering how much it truly is a favorite. So I got a heavy dose of talking about uh, client experience in my course for designers, Designer, because there's literally an entire module. It has 12 lessons and I counted it's five hours of content just on this one topic. And I think of the beta students would tell you like it's everyone's favorite module. There's so much good stuff in it. Um, so creating it felt like I finally got to say all the things I wanted to say. And it was so wonderful. So I say all that to say, I love this topic. And I really do believe that by improving your client experience, you're not only making your client happier, but you're also making yourself happier as a service provider. You're less likely to experience overwhelm. You're definitely less likely to experience burnout. And you're likely to be able to charge more too. So when projects go smoother, when things feel organized, when communication's done right, you have peace of mind. I like to think about it like if when your house is an absolute wreck, um, maybe the room you're trying to work in is a wreck, you can't relax as much because there's junk and clutter everywhere. That happens to me so often. I'm like, if the room feels too messy, I cannot just lie down and chill. Maybe that's, maybe that's just me, but it's that same kind of thing. So when your client experiences a mess, it's hard for you to relax, hard for you to trust yourself, hard for you to trust your process. So in addition to that, having a better client experience really will allow you to charge more because clients are are not buying your process. We're going to talk about this um, a little in this episode, but they're buying the result that the process takes them through. And so less headaches to get there. You better believe you can charge so much more for that. So without further ado, here are the top four mistakes I see designers and other service providers making with their client experience. All right, let's dive into that first mistake. So mistake number one, not utilizing templated responses, checklists, and other automated systems for your client process. So this is probably the biggest mistake of all, as in like the one that most people are making. So once you've done something perfectly once or perfectly enough, I guess I should say, you need to save it to be able to reuse it later. However, what I see so many people doing instead is constantly reinventing inventing the wheel with every single client project. Like you gotta have a system, but it's in your brain, but every client is getting their own little unique process. So for example, like let's say you're writing an email and as you're writing it like to your client, you feel like you've written it a thousand times because you probably have. And so that email should become a templated response. But instead, what I see so many people doing is you just keep rewriting it every single time. And almost like sometimes in the name of like you want the experience to be so personalized and so unique to each client. Like if I template it, it's going to feel um, robotic or something. That's just not true. You can edit the templates and it doesn't feel robotic, you're actually likely giving the client a way better experience because it's consistent and not something that you're having to just remember every time. So in addition to that, all the steps you have to go through to complete a project should not just be living in your brain. They should live on a checklist. Um, If you're anything like me, there's probably a lot of steps to your process. I know there like so is for mine, especially when I'm doing a brand and website together. And even more so when it's a client who has a website already somewhere else and I'm moving them to show it or like keeping them on show, but just like transferring content. Like there's so many moving parts and those steps should live in a checklist that you can duplicate for each project and then just start ticking through the checklist. This is how you make sure things do not fall through the cracks. If it's just living in your brain, you might forget something that's actually really important 
But like, like, for example, you could forget like to link up the Facebook pixel. Um, that's what I think of because that has happened to me before, before I started um, having really good um, systems with this, you might forget to add their Facebook pixel because it's so little and small. And like, maybe, maybe you don't do that with most of your clients. I do with all of mine now, but that's just one thought there. So they should live in a checklist. So my tip here would be next time you do a project, document the steps, create a master checklist that you can duplicate for each project, and then save things like that really great email you wrote, save it to your CRM, or even just to a Google document that you can like access and copy and paste it every time. For form questions, like maybe you send your clients an onboarding questionnaire, um, or maybe there's some things you know you always need to get from every client. Save that as a form so that you can reuse it. And remember, you can always edit it a little bit. So like, as you go to reuse that form, you could say like, oh, I actually don't need to ask um, the client this question. For this version of the form, I'm going to delete it. Um, I'm going to add this one in, you know, whatever it is. So inside of my book.designer course, um, like I said, there's five hours of content on this topic, but I share my exact client process, including my checklist for projects. So for branding projects and branding website projects and website alone too, I guess, technically. Um, and I share some of the templated responses I use, all kinds of stuff where you can really just like literally use what I'm using or use it as an example and adapt it to your own business. So I show you how to set it up your own version or use mine to make it work for you and your business and really take some of this headache away and not be making everything just live in your brain. So that is number one, the mistake is not utilizing templated responses, checklists and automated systems for your process. All right, mistake number two, this is also a huge one. I might say that for all these because these all feel huge, honestly. So mistake number two, not communicating expectations and boundaries to your clients. So I could talk about this one for days again, like maybe this needs a whole episode. But violated boundaries basically means that your client is doing something that you find to be like breaking a boundary. Um, unmet expectations um, from your clients um, and those violated boundaries tend to be the two biggest reasons I see projects go badly when I'm coaching and talking to other designers, other service providers. So what you need to do with every project is communicate your boundaries and what you expect from the client and what they should expect from you very clearly at the beginning of the project. Okay, so it starts at the beginning. And then that communication gets reiterated throughout the project in other small ways. So as an example, let's say you don't want your clients texting you on the weekends or at night, or maybe even ever, maybe you don't want to text with your clients, that's totally reasonable. Um, and maybe from your perspective, when you like have this new client, you're thinking, I would never like text a contractor I'm working with in the in the middle of the night or text them on the weekend or whatever. So you are assuming this person won't either because that's so not something you would do. You're applying your own experience to this person that you might not even really know yet because, hey, they're a new client. So then you give them your phone number at the start of the project and you tell them maybe it's for emergencies or something. And then you text them some small question while you are working on their project. And so now you've opened up texting communication. You've shown that you want to communicate that way, even though you didn't like say, I want to text with you, but you showed them by texting them. And so now the client starts texting you all the time. And now you feel like you've had a boundary violated But in reality, you just never told the client what to expect. You never communicated how this project's going to work. So I had this happen to me (laughs) once early on in my business. And it's kind of a funny story. So I texted the client first, right? And we had our communication set up to not be in texting, but I texted them. And then after that, when the client needed to send me her brand photos, she sent them all via text message. Um, And it's so crazy to me because I'm thinking I would never try to send, you know, a hundred photos over a text, right? But I never told her not to do that. She was just doing what made sense to her. So she had the photos on her phone. We were already in the middle of a texting conversation. And so she's thinking like, okay, I'll just send them this way. It's all the same. Because again, she doesn't do what I do. So she doesn't know that like, you know, getting them from iMessage over to my computer is going to be challenging or whatever. Um, so just know that kind of thing can happen. And I never communicated not to do that to her. So it's actually my fault as the service provider, because I did not clearly communicate that boundary and expectation. So communication is a huge one to figure out in your business. Some questions you want to be able 
to answer in order to avoid these kind of mistakes. Will you text with clients? Do they have Voxer access to you? Do you email with them or do you only communicate over a project management system? Um, can they just call you whenever with questions? Is your calendar always open for them to schedule a Zoom meeting with you just whenever they want to? Um, so those are kinds of things to think about. But in addition to that, you need to communicate with them things like your turnaround time, when they should expect to get messages from you about the project, when you will and won't respond. Think about your office hours. Um, For me, I actually have um, an expected response time for when the client is booked, but our project hasn't started yet. And then a different response time for when we are in the project and we're like actively working on it. So I define those. Um, Payment boundaries is a whole nother thing. Like what happens if they pay late? So you need to figure out your boundaries. You need to learn how to communicate them. Again, this whole boundary conversation and expectations like encompasses so many things, but I think like the biggest one is communication. So in Booked Out Designer, in case you're curious, um, and if you're soon already, you need to go watch this video, but I have an entire video on this where I share what my boundaries are with clients as an example, because I'm all about sharing like what I actually do. It's not just theory. It's like, hey, this is what I do. Uh, and I share all the different ones you need to consider. And if you want to just swipe um, my own language around this, or you know, use my template and then edit it to apply to your own business, there's actually a download with the exact communication document that my clients get upon working with me that communicates all this. So it's like something they get when they're onboarded. And then again, it's reiterated throughout the project. It's also my contract. And you also have access to the contract language as well inside a booked out designer of like, how do you phrase this in a contract? You can use mine if you'd like. But this is a really big one. So having this in place, having the clear communications, clear boundary, expectations, all that kind of stuff is going to lead to happier clients and a much happier you because you are not going to at every corner feel like, why is this client texting me? Why are they calling me? Why did they pay late? You know, why are they emailing me on the weekend and not respecting my time? All that kind of stuff is going to go away when you learn how to properly communicate things. And a little bonus tip here, um, I'm not going to expand on this one in this episode, but again, maybe this is something for another episode, but you need to properly onboard and offboard your clients with a system and plan. So having a process there, again, that falls into its own category, but it's really similar to communicating boundaries because it's the boundary of like, hey, when is this project over and when does it start? But again, that's a whole other conversation. I teach that in the course as well, but like something else to consider of like, are you clearly defining the project start date? And are you clearly offboarding the client so that they know, you know, hey, we're done working together. And this is how our communication is now that we're done working together. Interrupting this episode with a suggestion for the small business owners listening. Ever wonder what you should do for healthcare when you and your spouse are both self-employed so there's no work-provided health insurance to participate in? Well, when my husband Adam joined me in the entrepreneurial job space over four years ago, we joined Christian Healthcare Ministries instead of getting traditional health insurance. And it was the best decision for us, especially in these years of growing and raising a family while also running multiple businesses. CHM is a health cost sharing ministry and is a faith-based alternative to health insurance. We did tons of research before choosing CHM. And if you know me and Adam, you know, we are all about doing the math when making big or small financial decisions. And even though it's not insurance, CHM shares 100% of eligible medical bills, which is more than the typical 70 or 80% of medical bills paid for by insurance companies. All sharing is determined by the CHM guidelines, which you can check out before and after joining. And for the mamas and mamas to be listening, you truly cannot find a better healthcare option for maternity care. I had a vaginal delivery and a C-section and birth center care and hospital care between my two pregnancies and births, and it was all 100% shared for. And outside of birth, we've had our share of emergency room visits and procedures as a family, and those costs were all shared by members at Christian Healthcare Ministries, leaving us only paying our monthly contribution. CHM is less expensive month to month than insurance, and because there's no network, you can choose your care with whichever providers best fit your family. I seriously just cannot recommend Christian Healthcare Ministries enough. You've got to check them out. Go to elizabethmccravey.com slash CHM for more information. Also putting that link in the show notes, elizabethmccravey.com slash CHM. Now back to the episode. All right, mistake number three. 
adding in unnecessary extra work for your client in the name of quote unquote, great client experience. So this is probably my favorite one to blow people's minds with and get your eyes open to. It's also probably my biggest pet peeve that I see people um, making this mistake and not in like an I'm mad at you for making this mistake, but more of like, I feel for you and hurt for you that you're doing this because it hurts you and it hurts your client. So what I mean is that more steps does not equal a better experience. So more calls, more forms, more meetings, more communication does not equal better. If your client could skip your entire process and just get the result from working with you, they would. In basically any situation, I'm sure you could come up with some business model where that's not true. But in most cases, everyone would skip the experience and just get the results. So like, as designers, we would, um, you know, your client, if they could not do the process of working with you and just get the finished website or brand or whatever it is, they would. Um, even thinking about things like health coaching, like if they could not do the personal training sessions with you and all the meetings and just get the result of fitness, they would. Um, So many different things, people would skip it for the results. So making the process to get the result more complex, more detailed and more involved does not make it better. If anything, it can actually make it feel harder and more challenging and less fun. And it's more work for you. In most cases, when you are overly involving your client in your work. So for me, what I do to combat this, I have the minimal amount of meetings possible with a client. I figured out what works for me. I figured out what the right number is. It's different when it's just branding. It's different when it's branding web together or just a website project. And every meeting has a purpose. And that purpose is never for me to quiz them about their ideal client avatar or ask them questions that I could find the answer to elsewhere. They are always very intentional meetings. And then I make communication easy and organized by using a project management system that they're in with me and also utilizing back and forth videos to communicate with clients. Sometimes it's faster and way easier than um, long email threads. They're confusing and things get lost. Um, A fun fact, I actually don't email with my clients once they've booked with me. So during, you know, before the project starts, we're emailing during the projects. We're not, we're communicating on a client management um, system, project management management system. Uh, and then after the project, we go back to email and I explain how all that works inside a booked out designer. But guys, just don't make the mistake of thinking that extra steps are a great experience. You hear someone say that they meet with a client, you know, 10 times in three months for a website project. And you're like, oh, I should do that too. Consider if that's actually helping you create better work if it's actually something your client wants. Because again, I think most people want like less meetings, they want their time back. That's why they're paying you to do this work instead of doing it themselves. Um, So if the step is really important and helpful, uh, then absolutely do it. So don't hear me saying like, don't ever talk to your clients and don't ever meet with them and don't do any steps. I do not mean that at all. It's called the client experience and client process for a reason because it is a process. But don't just add things in with no purpose because you're like, it'll be cool if I have this extra like touch point in here. Um, ask yourself, is this really going to help or not? So that's number three, adding in unnecessary extra work for your client in the name of client experience. And time for our fourth and final mistake. Not having a system for how you build clients and how and when you collect those payments. So every client should not be on a unique payment plan. Okay, I literally, I mean, again, this applies to most service businesses, like regardless of what you're doing, everyone does not need to be on a unique payment plan schedule. And definitely not one where you are having to remember to invoice the client each time, or they're Venmoing you every time or whatever it is. So as an example, here's what you want to avoid an example bad scenario. So let's say you have three clients right now. One of them is on a six month payment plan because they really need to spread it out. Another one's on a four month payment plan because they were like, I kind of need to spread it out. And the other one's on a three month payment plan. And you basically left it up to the client to decide instead of saying, here's my payment plan schedule, you said, how many months would you like to pay this off in? And so that's what they came up with. And all of their due dates, you have written on sticky notes on your desk. And every time you need to invoice them, you make a new invoice in Adobe Illustrator or Canva or wherever, and you edit the dates and the amount and whatever else. And then you save it as a PDF and you write them a unique email that's not from a template. 
and you email it to them and tell them that their payments to you. And so you have to do this for all three clients at all different times of the month. And you have to like remember their schedule when they paid and all that. And so one client forgets to pay and then you forget that they didn't pay. And so when you go to do the, your end of the month finances, you see, oh my gosh, I'm missing their money. This client never paid and that was 15 days ago. And so now you have to email them again and be like, hey, I just realized like this payment's overdue and so on and so forth. So maybe what I just described is your payment plan system. Um, hilariously, what I just described is really similar to what mine was when I first started my business. I got it under control really quickly. So it was a very temporary amount of time that it was like that. But I legit was making my invoices in Adobe Illustrator. I had a template, of course, I was working from, but I was like going in every time, be like, wait, hey, change the invoice date, change the amount, change the due date, change the client name. And like, why was I doing that? I don't know. Um, if you're a designer, I think sometimes we think things need to be prettier than they actually do. And my um, invoice was pretty, I think, <laughs> um, looking back on it, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't need to be pretty, right? And so I was having to remember all the due dates and track everything down. And in addition to everything I just said, um, to make it even worse, the clients were all Venmoing me, which made tracking the payments and if they had happened yet really painful. Again, I wasn't doing that for a long time, but I was doing it early on and it is not sustainable at all. You are wasting so much of your time. And so what you need to do to fix it and what I did to fix it is to implement a CRM like Dubsado or HoneyBook. Um, I personally use Dubsado. I use it to bill your clients. And I also, in the course, I show you some other alternative ones if you feel like you're not ready for an entire CRM, but you want to be able to schedule invoices and stuff with a free software. Anyway, just so that's an option too. So if you're thinking like, um, I'm not ready for Debs Auto or HoneyBook, there are other things. But basically, you need payment plans that are standardized and you need automated emails that are attached to those payment plans that will automatically send to your clients when their payment is due. That way you set it up once and you don't have to think about it or talk to your clients about it. And then the money just flows in. I personally, um, and my clients who've worked with me know this, like I want to talk money on the discovery call and then then book me. And then we don't really talk about money anymore. We're just talking about the project. And when you have no system in place for payments, it leads you guys to end up having to talk about payment dates and stuff like that um, unnecessarily. So anyway, I show you exactly what payment plan system I recommend for most projects as a designer inside a booked out designer. But depending on what you do, that plan might be different. Like maybe you need to always offer a 12 month payment plan. I don't know. You need to figure that out though. But regardless of what the payment schedule is, you should be able to set it up and forget about it, basically. Um, and the system is what reminds your client to pay and tells them to pay. Um, your time and energy is much better spent actually doing the client project, not making customized invoices and hunting down payments and all of that kind of stuff. And of course, there are unique scenarios where like even when you have a great system, you will have a client who doesn't pay and like they're getting those automated reminders and they still keep not paying. And you need systems around that as well. Like, like I was saying earlier, you know, what happens when a client doesn't pay you on time? Um, that's something that should go in your contract and that you would be able to enforce if needed, um, or have a conversation about regardless. So that's my last one. Um, yeah, I'm going to recap the one not having a system for how you build clients or how and when you collect those payments. So that is it Four mistakes you might be making with your client experience. They're probably causing you headaches, as you can tell from, I mean, all those like horrible bad scenario examples I just gave here and causing your clients headaches as well. And as always, there is more to this. So many more ideas come to mind for me. I actually had six total to start and I was like, I'm going to cut this down in an effort to make this episode a little shorter and easier for you guys to listen to all the way. So maybe we'll have to do a part two sometime with even more mistakes. Let me know, like send me a DM on Instagram or something if you think you would like that. And like I said, there is five hours of training on this exact topic of client experience inside a booked out designer. Each of these things, each of these mistakes, I teach you how to make not a mistake. And in addition to that, you always have the Facebook community when you join Booked Out Designer and coaching calls with me, where you could ask me specific questions about your client experience and get help and feedback. So you could say, Elizabeth, here's what this looks like for me. How can I fix this? What can I do? I'm having this bad client experience. What's advice here? And I'm there to help you. Um, and if you're listening to this episode live, 
Um, then the doors to Booked Out Design are opening again on July 12th. Um, so get on the wait list at elizabethmccravey.com slash BOD. I'll put that link in the show notes. It's short for Booked Out Designer. Um, so you can go there, um, just type that link in and you can actually get more info on what to expect from the course on that page and see some video testimonials from students and some other fun stuff. And then you can put your name on the wait list. So you'll be the first to know when the course is open and also have, um, I don't want to like spoil, I don't want to spoil it too much, but access to like some more insider stuff to help you make the decision about the course or not. So anyway, um, that's what I'll say about that. So I hope you'll join me in this round of the course though. I am so excited about welcoming new students in. Um, actually at the time of recording this, I spent all morning and then all day yesterday designing the sales page for Booked Out Designer. Um, I also wrote the copy for the sales page last week and it is the longest sales page I've ever written. It was 23 pages in a Google Doc. Um, and now it's on a sales page. So get excited to read that. Um, whenever the doors open, I think it's a pretty stellar sales page. It was really fun for me to do that kind of writing and sales page design for my own business. Cause I actually hadn't designed a sales page for myself in a little while because I've been doing them for clients instead and haven't had anything new to design a sales page for. So anyway, yeah, I'm excited for you guys to see that. And I hope you'll join in the, me in the course. I seriously would love to help you improve your client experience. I'd love to help you book out with dreamy clients at higher rates than what you're doing right now. And all of that is a part of Booked Out Designer. So that is it, friends. I'll be back next week with another episode. Hey, thanks for listening to the podcast today and for staying until the end. I appreciate you being here. And if you enjoyed this episode, then I want to invite you to check out my online course and coaching program for designers, Booked Out Designer. In this program, I teach you how to build a successful in-demand booked out business as a designer. You'll learn everything from the exact experience I take my clients through to things like figuring out your niche, mastering discovery calls, pricing your services for profit, creating contracts that will not call you legal troubles and my exact social media strategies to book clients. You even get to watch recordings of me in actual meetings with my actual clients so you can really learn through what you're seeing. We take things you're learning on this podcast and so many topics I never even cover on the show and deep dive into them. So in addition to the amazing course, the course is nine modules of teaching with over 90 lessons. You get group coaching calls with me and access to an exclusive Facebook community of designers just like you. And fun fact, this isn't one of those kind of Facebook groups where the founder never comments on posts or you never see them in there. You'll find me there all the time ready to help you out with any business question you have. So to get info on the course and to see when the doors will be opening again, head to elizabethmccravey.com slash BOD, short for booked out designer. I hope to be able to coach you and teach you inside of the course soon. And don't forget that you can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening so that you never miss an episode. And a great way to support the show is to leave a rating and review, share it with a friend, share it on social media. All of that will help get the word out. All right, I'll see you again next week.